this week on Forward. So the challenge really is, can either party break away from their quote unquote incumbent <laughs> in order to present a better alternative to the country? It's also kind of prisoner's dilemma, right? I mean, it's not like, you know, everyone's going to naturally do the thing that's sort of best for the system as a whole. I think the tastes and desires of the political class on both sides is really sits on the opposite side of uh, of working class voters. And, you know, I really feel like my job as a pollster is really to bring that perspective, especially if it's not demographically who I am. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast political vet, pollster, co-founder of Echelon Insights, and author of the very informative new book, Party of the People, Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition, Remaking the GOP, Patrick Ruffini. Welcome, Patrick. Great to be here, Andrew. So, Patrick, you are a data wonk, a nerd. It's good fun. Um, I, I got to say, I haven't read a book this chock full of data in quite some time. How does one become a pollster? Well, it's an interesting question because I didn't initially start out as a pollster. I started out doing uh, the digital side of campaigning and uh, working with a lot of data and really learning my way as a pollster um, uh, based on uh, a lot of that initial experience, trying to bring in more of that initial experience. So the, the polling is not all that I do. A lot of it is data work. A lot of it is sort of figuring out what we can learn from digital insights. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I really feel like you're seeing it right now with so many young people. Um, uh, you have it on election Twitter. You've got these places where people are conversing about individual races or conversing about trends in particular state. We ha states. We have so much availability of data now that really the field is wide open for anyone to join. In fact, what? I talk to high school students. Someone let's say are, this could be like, polls. yeah, it's time to become like, like Patrick. It's good fun. Um, so we're going to talk about your book, and then we're going to talk about 2024, because I'm sure you're on TV all the time being asked about 2024. But first, this book that I thought was really, really well done. I think this is your first book, correct? Yes. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. You clearly did a lot of work. What spurred you to write this book? And uh, what is the, the big idea? Yeah, the big idea is that, you know, our parties have fundamentally changed. So when I first got involved in politics about 20 years ago, um, it was taken as an article of faith that um, there was a class divide in American politics. And the Democrats stood on the side of the worker in that class divide. They stood on the side of, uh, you know, the common man. They went by the sort of nickname party of the people. And at their best, you know, the Democrats represented this broad middle class majority and were able to successfully define Republicans as uh, defenders of the rich, defenders of the wealthy. We saw that, uh, you know, most recently, I feel like in 2012, uh, where Barack Obama very effectively did that to Mitt Romney, uh, you know, portraying as a, him as a titan of private equity and out of touch with average working families. And I feel like really that definition in the Trump era has gone out the window. Uh, and it's gone out the window because of the decisions of uh, people on both sides of the aisle, both Donald Trump redefining the Republican Party more in populist terms, redefining it less in terms of, uh, you know, we are going to have strict economic conservatism with spending cuts and tax cuts. Um, and uh, the Democrats responding in kind, saying, uh, you know, Trump represents a threat to democracy, a cultural threat more than he does a threat to, let's say, working families, which was sort of the core of the bread and butter economic messaging of the Democratic Party. As a result, we've seen a dramatic realignment of voters right in this era where it's not only you have your white working class voters in the upper Midwest uh, moving towards the Republicans and your white college educated voters in the suburbs moving towards the Democrats, but you're increasingly seeing non-white voters in play for Republicans um, because of this change in emphasis on, on the side of both parties. All right. So here's the big idea. In 2004, uh, this idea emerged from a book, The Emerging Democratic Majority, that said the country is getting more diverse. Diverse people vote Democratic. Uh, it's getting less white, rural uh, and old. 
Uh, young people also like Democrats more. So the Democrats will experience a wind at their backs by virtue of demographics that will lead to a sustained majority. And this was borne out in part by Obama's resounding victory in 08. Uh, his victory in 2012 didn't completely debunk it. But in many ways, your book is the big fact-based counterpoint saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. It turns out that that is not correct because of the fact that now the single biggest deal in American politics is not whether you're white or non-white. It's whether you have a college degree or not. Is that a, a fair summary? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that like there, in the wake of the Obama victories, uh, there was definitely a thought process on the left that said, look at all the groups that Obama won, winning young voters by two to one, winning, uh, you know, these expanded majorities among African-Americans doing much better among Latinos, that all these groups are just growing, are going to become more influential in the years to come. And so, uh, you know, we don't really need to change our message. We don't need to moderate our message in order to win, um, that we can just wait for the demographic tides to eventually make it so that, uh, you know, we are going to see the end of, you know, white Christian conservative America, I think was one of the titles of books, you know, kind of the titles of books that came out in this era. But that was a dramatic misreading of both what Obama actually did and uh, both demographically and, uh, you know, message wise. So, um, you know, what you actually saw, uh, you know, during the Obama era was he, him appealing effe very effectively uh, to these, um, you know, working class people, specifically white working class people in deindustrializing parts of the country. So he did extremely well in the upper Midwest and Midwestern states and states like Michigan and that were experiencing, um, you know, were experiencing an economic collapse because the auto industry uh, was collapsing and he very effectively promoted the auto bailout in 2012 and made that a major dividing line in that election. So I think people like to focus on, look at all the things he did with young progressives, right? And, and mobilizing young progressives and he did that, but it was in, within a coalition of voters who were more conservative temperamentally, which was kind of that white working class, Midwestern auto worker, factory worker uh, that voted for Obama. And then shift over to voting for Trump. So what happens when uh, what happens in that you know scenario is that the Democrats start blaming, really start um, start attacking um, those voters who you know calling them racist, calling them people who uh, you know are racially resentful. But they, in fact, they voted for Obama. So how how can that be true? It was you know Trump uniquely spoke to them in the in, in the same way that Obama uniquely spoke to them. And I think, um, you know, it's funny because you mentioned the emerging Democratic majority, and that was really kind of how it was interpreted, right, as this surge of non-white and progressive uh, voices in the electorate. But um, the authors of that book have a new book out, actually, that uh, and they have already said, like, no, this was wasn't going to come true because specifically our book really also said you need to worry about the white working class. You need to maintain hold serve with the white working class Democrats, and they just haven't done so. And in fact, the rhetoric towards those working class voters in the Midwest um, has been anything but welcoming since 2016. Oh, yeah, I, I campaigned a lot in the Midwest, and I ran into a lot of white working class voters who did not think the Democratic Party was into them. <laughs> that was uh, part of it. Uh, and uh, there's a guy named David Shore, who you cite uh, and seem, seemingly agree with that um, one of the things that's happened is Democratic Party messaging has gotten taken over by uh, college graduate concerns uh, and that the messaging thus hits harder among college graduates, not shockingly. One, one thing I enjoyed about your book is it pointed out a set of facts that people often do not realize, which is that uh, only about 35 percent of voters have a college degree in full. Um, 65 percent don't. The average voter is maybe 50, 52 years old. And so when you start visualizing that voter, you have a much better read uh, on on things. So would, do you think that the Republican Party, uh, and this is one thing I'm, I'm interested in, is that so the Democratic political class is obviously dominated by college graduates. I mean, I've met a lot of those people. I can't remember virtually anyone who, who didn't <laughs> have yeah. a college degree. Um, now, uh, among Republicans, I'd imagine it's the same, but are, are do they just do a better job of somehow 
uh, avoiding certain types of appeals that only work on college grads? It's it's yes and no. All right. I think this is really interesting in the era of Trump. What has happened to a lot, many people in the Republican political class who, again, share who are all college graduates. Right. I mean, it's practically a, a de facto requirement for working in politics. And, you know, really, um, that's the media, too. Yeah. We get right. I mean, it's not necessarily that we require People are required to have a college degree, but culturally speaking, like that's who ends up working on campaigns. That's who ends up working in media. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that didn't used to be a problem prior to 2012, but there wasn't this huge education divide in the country that, you know, you you had college graduates who were roughly speaking in line with the views of non-college graduates. Right. But um, in t- post 2016, that is no longer the case. And so I, I think it's interesting in the sense of, you have the same problem on the right in the sense of you had so many people who during 2016, I, it, this happened to some extent to me that were really disillusioned by Donald Trump were really disillusioned by his candidacy, did not like what was happening. And I think it was stylistically, you had so many Republicans who have more moderate positions on social issues, uh, but more, who are more economically conservative. And as I show in the book, that's not really when you survey voters, that is not really where most voters are. Most most voters, if they're if they're cross pressured on social and economic issues, are more economically liberal and socially conservative. Um, so in many ways, the I think the tastes and desires of the political class on both sides is really sits on the opposite side of uh, of working class voters. And you know, I really feel like my job as a pollster is really to bring that perspective in, even though it's not like that even if it's not demographically who I am, especially if it's not demographically who I am, I need to bring those perspectives in um, to show people like this is how most people are thinking. Uh, this sure. is the worldview of most people, as opposed to, you know, kind of projecting my own worldview onto a lot of people who don't hold those issues, don't hold those same priorities. How are you going to get healthier this year? One way to do so is to have healthy, chef-crafted meals delivered to your door stress-free. What the heck am I talking about? Factor. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon to a healthier, happier you. I've been eating Factor for this last number of weeks, and wow, it's been a game changer. We're talking about delicious chicken taco bowl, spicy poblano beef, and every time I'm like, ooh, This is going to be tasty, and it is. Makes you feel good. It's cost efficient. It's flexible. No prep, no mess. You can't screw it up. Just poke a couple holes in it, heat it up, and it's fresh, never frozen. I got to say, if you try Factor, you are going to be pumped. It's going to make you healthier, happier, more productive in the new year. Head to factormeals.com slash yang50 and use code yang50 to get 50% off. That's code YANG50 at factormeals.com slash YANG50 to get 50% off. Factor! In my view, your book, uh, if I were to simplify it, um, here's the message, is that there are a lot of non-college educated non-white voters that Democrats in the political class assume, of course, they got to vote for us because we're the party of the diverse. And uh, what are they going to do? Vote for Republicans? The Republicans are racist. Um, but it turns out in real life, uh, a lot of non-white, non-college graduates uh, actually are very into the Republican Party, uh, where Trump is competing at parity among Latino populations in various parts of the country. Um, there's been a drift towards the Republican Party among uh, Asian Americans. You can even see a little bit of it in the black community, albeit from a very, very low base. Uh, and, and that struck me as the the underpinning of this is that, look, if you just assumed every Latino, Asian, uh, black voter is going to vote Democratic and those populations are going to rise, then all set, Democrats. <laughs> and, and what you're saying is, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you look at the data... It turns out that Democrats have increasingly become the party of the college educated and that if you're a non-college educated Latino, Asian or black voter, you're actually going to be drifting towards the GOP. Hence, the GOP becoming this multiracial coalition party. Uh, Is that uh, did I get that right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this book, you know, I think, I wouldn't say this book specifically, I think reality has challenged a lot of those assumptions that um, people made about the electorate. So, you know, specifically, one of the major failings of this uh, demography as destiny theory was that Latinos would behave the same way as Black voters have historically as uh, members of a cohesive identity group that would uh, move Democratic on the issue of immigration because they favored more legal immigration or favored more, uh, you know, a more open immigration policy that included a pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants. And that was really kind of the major thinking around 2012. It, you know, that has been proven wrong. I think partly because you sort of misunderstood, it misunderstands the motivation of most Latino voters. Most Latino voters don't see themselves as part of this unified block of people. They certainly don't see themselves as Latinx, but... Uh, yeah, continue. they don't see themselves as Latinx. <laughs> they don't always necessarily see themselves as, as part of this pan-Latino community, right? Um, uh, when you actually talk to them, they, you, people say, I'm Mexican, I'm Venezuelan. But more, more often than that... Uh, they just kind of see themselves as regular Americans. I mean, I think in a lot of places they're very, they're, you know, you've got people who are second also many, many of them are are deeply religious and uh, part of a like a church community, right? And so I don't think you can mobilize them right on this sort of identity politics. Um, but I think that there's also a risk, right, where Democrats feel right now they have a little bit of initiative on this abortion issue, which I, I think you know to some extent. Look, uh, you can't argue with the election results in some of these states that have had referenda on the issue. But I, I think they're not necessarily thinking about how they're branding and defining their party, right? Um, you know, that I think from a coalitional standpoint, you've got a lot of people who are in, within the Democratic Party who have more conservative views on social issues than have more conservative views on, let's say, economic issues. And so long term, when the political you know, sugar high of that issue kind of recedes, what are you left with? You're left with a party that is defined more and more by its left of center views on cultural issues than it, you know, has, it had been defined, whereas it had been defined previously by really standing up for the working class who are the majority, vast majority of the country um, based on lines of college educations and on economics too. I would love, love, love for the Democratic Party uh, or any party to start hitting policies and messages that would appeal to the non-white, non-college educated working class of this country. Because if you improve their lives, you're probably doing something great. You're probably doing something that brings down the cost of housing, bring down, brings down the cost of health care, brings down the cost of education, uh, makes it more affordable to be, uh, you know, the... Um, mother or father of a child, make you feel better about the future. So that would make me very, very excited. I certainly think that uh, I, I was on CNN a while ago and I said, look, um, you know what people don't like is a uh, political party as the culture police. It's like, hey, you say or do the wrong thing. You use the wrong word. You're not keeping track of <laughs> the, the, the right terminology. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're, you're somehow in the outs. I mean, that that, that is a very, very... Uh, esoteric message that does not speak to the non-white working class. Like, um, so so that that's something I would love to see parties take uh, wisdom um, from you and your data uh, in in those regards. I mean, it, it seems like you think the Democratic Party it's it's not going to pick up on this, and clearly there have been a number of people, David Shore among them, who've been like, hey, guys, maybe you should do something that people actually want. <laughs> like, if you look at the data. And then, you know, and then you pointed out David Shore actually lost a job um, in in part because, you know, he, he said something that went against the orthodoxy um, in a particular way. Uh, so you're staring at numbers more than any, any of the rest of us, even more than me, even though I do it a fair amount. So when when this airs, Republicans will just be about to start voting in the Republican primary. Um, so my read on it is that it's going to be Trump, 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 uh, that Nikki Haley is his strongest opponent. Um, but because of the fragmented field, uh, it's likely that Trump wins Iowa. Uh, it will come down to New Hampshire-ish. And then Nikki has to win South Carolina to have any chance to be viable uh, thereafter. But that it's uh, unlikely that we're probably looking at a Trump 
nomination. Uh, does the data tell you the same thing? Yeah, I mean, what, what the data is showing right now, uh, and it's um, uh, you're starting to see some movement upward for Nikki Haley in New Hampshire, particularly because that is a very independent minded electorate, as you well know, uh, and that you have a lot of crossover voters uh, in the New Hampshire primary that could upend, uh, you know, certainly has upended the previous front runners uh, and uh, has frustrated the path to the nomination that when, when people are, are supposed to waltz to the nomination, they usually hit a stumbling block in New Hampshire. But I think in general, what we're starting to see across the board on both the Republican and the Democratic side is the early states simply aren't mattering as much because I think voters overall are really to, more tuned in and engaged at a baseline level than they have been in, in maybe decades past. Interesting. And so, you know, national polls actually, I mean, they're not predictive. I think you, you want to take the first reading of the national poll after Iowa, after New Hampshire to really confirm what direction this is going. Um, but I also think that, you know, let's not forget Trump was the president. Trump is a strong front runner uh, for the nomination. He hasn't really made any major stumbles. If you're not counting his, you know, if you're not counting his criminal cases, he hasn't really made any major stumbles in the nomination uh, fight. And so, uh, you know, he'll be tough to dislodge because he's not like a conventional kind of normal party front runner. He, you know, actually has come back from being president before. So, um, uh, so I do think it's a, it's a tough road um, for Nikki Haley or for Ron DeSantis or someone else. But I do think we could see a surprise, especially in New Hampshire. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Please do hit like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified every time a new episode drops. Probably on Mondays, but hit that bell and thank you. Uh, wow, New Hampshire, January 23rd, uh, which we're going to return to in just a minute uh, because I, I'm very, very keyed into what New Hampshire does on January 23rd. So. The numbers also have Joe Biden's support really kind of collapsing over the last two or three months. Um, it's been jarring to see. The composite right now has him at 38%. He's been at as low as 37%. Pew had him at 33%, which is crazy. Uh, I mean, that's low. Um, and and it, it's much lower than, let's say, Obama was uh, in 2012 at this stage, which was 48%. Obama obviously went on to beat Romney. Anyone who was close to where Joe is went on to lose, which included Jimmy Carter. Um, uh, Joe's numbers are worse than Carter's were. I mean, think about that one, because like you think about Jimmy Carter presiding over uh, a really difficult uh, period. And so two, three months ago, if you'd asked me, hey, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump's uh, toss up is going to be close. You can see it either way. Now, Trump is up by, according to Bloomberg, 10 in Michigan, five in Georgia virtually tied in Minnesota, which is a state that Biden won by seven points in 2020. Uh, you look at some of those numbers in individual states and just blanket 37, 38% approval rating. It feels like Trump wins in the general uh, if the election was held today. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? I think he's got to be considered at least a slight favorite um, for the, uh, and you have to should take the polls at face value, but it's a year out, right? So there's a large error band on 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 that prediction, but um, but you just I just taking the polls at at face value, which I do, that I do think that Biden is in trouble. <laughs> so so uh, gently put, um, well, yeah. and, and part two because. You know, I mean, like one, two, three polls, like, okay, okay. But now I've, I've seen 13 polls. I mean, you know, like the, like the picture is pretty uh, comprehensive. Right. I mean, so before, right, the idea was, well, Trump is never going to lead in a poll, right? I mean, 2016, 2020, you never saw Trump lead, actually leading in the polls, right? You, you saw was... Well, Trump is keeping it close and yep. maybe he's got this weird coalitional thing in the Electoral College that's going to put him over the yep. top. Right. And now there's no there's no, you know, uh, he's still got the Electoral College right advantage. Right. Because I think when you have a working class coalition that's going to over index for states that lean a little bit more red and especially in this new alignment, you've got states like Michigan. Um, that are going to start voting to the right of the country as a whole, even though the state Republican Party are there is a complete absolute mess. So it's no thanks to the state Republican Party in Michigan. Um, but what you're starting to see is demographically, it's a state 
that, um, you know, really does favor Trump. But, you know, Biden is also maybe having some trouble with the Arab American vote in Detroit. So that could explain part of this. But um, but um, but what you're starting to see is sort of, you know, the Democrats kind of neglect of, you know, voters in this upper Midwest, uh, Midwestern band of states um, has really made them to the point where, again, it's not only do you have Trump has maybe an advantage in some of those states that are specifically very critical to the Electoral College, but he also has now a popular vote advantage. And by the way, he has a popular vote advantage because the polls, at least right now, are showing him gaining, uh, you know, a really strong uh, strong gains among both African Americans and Latino voters uh, over and above uh, what he did in 2020, which is actually quite limited on the African American front, more impressive on the Latino front. But the polls right now are showing him improving. And I think when you look at the issue set, it's no surprise why, right? Uh, you know, the issues of cost of living, um, you know, it's economy and stewardship right yeah. now. And, you know, yeah. that's going to hit the working class hardest. Yeah, uh, young people too. In in these polls, uh, you know, there was one poll that had Trump at parity among young people, which again is pretty disastrous uh, for Joe Biden. You mentioned Arab Americans in Michigan. I think that they're three or four percent of the population. Which even if they just don't show up to vote for Biden, uh, then that that's the margin of victory, right there. Now we're talking about these polls, and you said, "Hey, look, Trump. You wouldn't expect him to be ahead, but he has." some advantages in the Electoral College and the composition of his vote share. Um, uh, in reverse, Biden kind of needs a several point lead to be a parity, right? Because of the way that these that that the map shakes out, like uh, like Biden plus two is essentially a tie. So Biden minus two or three, it has essentially has him down five points. Um, do, do I have that? essentially cor correct. I think that's right. I mean, there's, there's some, there's some pundits that say that's not really true anymore. If you, you know, again, as Trump is making all these gains with let's say the Latinos, right. He's going to shift California, right. He's going to shift New York, right. He's going to shift some of these States, right. That are blue States. And so it doesn't, it's not going to matter as much. We will see if that's the case. He kind of did that in 2020 and it got worse, but it's kind of luck of the draw, right. I mean, you kind of need to get lucky in some of these States, right. Uh, it, you know, uh, so maybe, it, you know, the upside for Democrats, it's kind of like 2022, right, where they don't actually win the popular vote for the House, at least. Um, but they really make a strong case in these very tight Biden voting, like Biden plus two districts, right? Can't elect the Republicans because they're going to overturn the results of the election. They're kind of crazy. And they actually successfully make the case specifically in those districts and in those seats. I think it's going to be harder to do. I think the dynamics this year have shifted, um, uh, you know, and it's more of an economic argument. And you are, you know, potentially making it against somebody. Again, remember, you're just it's, really it's going to be the top of the ticket this time. Like Biden wasn't on the top of the ticket in 22. And by the way, he didn't no. even campaign in a lot of these places because his numbers were underwater. So everyone was like, don't worry about it. We got it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. Right. But, but I also just think like a lot of things you hear in focus groups. All right. I just remember I maybe voted for Biden last time. And I think but the reason people say they've, they've voted for Biden sometimes is because I didn't like the chaos under Trump. I didn't like what he was doing on racial issues. I didn't like, you know, kind of the sense like things were kind of off the rails. Um, but the economy was good. Right. And now the economy for a lot of people isn't as good, at least perception wise. We can talk about what the reality is, but the perception is the perception and perception often becomes reality. And so, um, you know, the right now, what they're doing is just comparing the economic performance and the perceived economic performance of both of these people. Trump is up 25 points among independents on that issue, uh, the economy. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. When you go to the bathroom, you always close the door behind you because you don't want random people seeing what you're doing. But when you go online, people sometimes can see what you're doing. I'm talking about those big tech companies and other folks who might not have your best interest at heart. That's why I use ExpressVPN and you should too. This way, your data stays yours. It can't be sold and resold. When I use ExpressVPN, you just click one button, transports you to another server, and also give you access to fun content that might be available 
in another country. It's like you're a global traveler without ever leaving your home. Get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free by going to expressvpn.com slash yang. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash yang for three extra months free. Expressvpn.com slash yang. So Patrick, here's my perspective. Uh, let's say I don't want Donald Trump to be president, which I don't. I mean, shocker. Um, uh, and I think that Biden uh, in 2020 might have been the strongest nominee the Democrats could field. And in 2024, he's the weakest. Uh, you know, 37 percent approval. People are fed up. He's going to he's going to be turning 82, essentially. Uh, and it's very hard to reinvent grandpa is what, uh, you know, I, I was saying. Um, they spent $25 million to boost his numbers in the swing states, and it had zero effect. The Bidenomics thing is a total dud. Uh, they, they should never have named the economy after him. <laughs> and that if you're the Democrats and you want to defeat Donald Trump, the move is to switch nominees. You should have a primary. Uh, Dean Phillips is already in the field. I think Dean would be a much stronger opponent against Trump than Joe because Dean's 54. No one's heard of him, so people don't hate him yet. And that this is the greatest opportunity because the majority of Democratic voters are uncomfortable with Joe too. Uh, you know, I mean, I voted for Joe. I campaigned for Joe. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, like I, I, and I'm really uncomfortable with the fact that the Democratic Party is not having a process. I mean, that is demented where you have in this case, a sitting member of Congress raising his hand saying, hey, guys, like I'm running, too. And, like, and you know, places like Florida, are like, no, no, no. Um, I mean, that that is nuts, especially given the head to head picture between Biden and Trump. Um, so what are your thoughts on generic Democrat versus Trump uh, as opposed to Joe Biden versus Trump? I think generic anyone wins in this cycle, right? I mean, if you had generic Republican against Biden, it, would, it wouldn't, I mean, I, it's not maybe, maybe it's not close now. It's kind of close. It would not be close. And you saw Hale, Nikki Haley was up 17 uh, against Joe Biden in the Wall Street Journal poll. What I think that's reflective of is, you know, with all due respect to Nikki Haley, and I think she is a formidable candidate, but I think that's more reflective of we just want someone else, uh, you know, anyone someone else. Someone else. Has, Someone else, yeah. someone else, put up the chat, someone yeah. else. Someone else. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I think Nikki Haley would trounce Joe Biden. <laughs> the, the general of Nikki Haley were the, the nominee. You know, I mean, what, what we're saying goes on both sides. Uh, the polls I saw had generic Republican beating Joe Biden by 10, you know, all the way up to 17. Uh, <laughs> the, the flip side, generic Democrat beats Trump by, let's call it eight. Uh, and so the challenge really is, can either party break away from their, quote unquote, incumbent <laughs> in order to present a better alternative to the country? It's also kind of prisoner's dilemma, right? I mean, it's not like, you know, everyone's going to naturally do the thing that's sort of best for the system as a whole, that each party has kind of these internal dynamics and internal imperatives that, you know, the Democrats believe that, uh, you know, this would be to... Uh, fragmented a process that it would be too damaging internally to the party. And I think the main reason, though, beyond beyond this sort of the, it would be messy, right, is the fear they might end up with Kamala. Right. I mean, that's that's sort of really the main barrier. Oh, my gosh. Patrick, you, you think that's the, the... She has a human shield right here in this situation. Right. That, uh, you know, you don't want to uh, you know, you, you don't want to get rid of him because you could end up with her. It has, a, you know, if, if anyone might be even weaker than Joe Biden, it could be her. Well, you know, if you have a competitive primary and Kamala runs, then, you know, see how it shakes out. I mean, I think everyone would be OK with that. I, I personally don't think Kamala would emerge from that process. Um, and uh, but, hey, you know, if you have a real competitive Democratic primary, um, then everyone can have at it. Uh, I, I'm uh, deeply concerned about. Uh, the Democrats essentially shrugging our, our way into a loss to Trump, uh, shrugging their way into a, a loss to Trump. Um, and so this is why I'm so laser focused on New Hampshire voting on January 23rd, because uh, at least one poll I saw had Dean Phillips at 15 percent and Joe Biden at 27 percent with the mass undecided. And Joe Biden, um, because of his punishment of New Hampshire, his name does not appear on the ballot, so people have to write him in, which I'm going to suggest will probably, uh, you know, reduce his number somewhat. So if if Dean Phillips 
uh, can grow, grow, grow and defeat the sitting president in the first state, I feel like everyone's going to snap to attention and say, wait, what just happened? Because right now, the predominant message people are getting is like, oh, it's Joe, it's Joe. And a lot of folks are uh, very uncomfortable with that and being like, really, that's a plan? <laughs> that if, uh, if New Hampshire says it's not Joe, then everyone will be like, it's not Joe. Uh, and, and then uh, a real process might break out. So to me, January 23rd is the date and what happens in New Hampshire. Um, are, are you similarly focused on New Hampshire on both sides? I mean, if it's, you know, the only, I am, I am focused on New Hampshire. I'm focused on, you know, the possibility in the Republican side, could there be an upset? Um, there's a recent poll, Nikki Haley sort of within 15 points of Trump in New Hampshire based on the strength of independent voters. And you still have Chris Christie taking up 10, 10%. So do his voters kind of migrate to her? Um, but yeah, on the Democratic side, it's just, it's really tough to see because, um, you know, you might think Dean Phillips is he, Dean Phillips is in the race. Um, are they actually going to nominate Dean Phillips? Probably not. Um, I, I think, you know, he, he he was trying to position himself as kind of a stalking horse for maybe a more prominent figure, aggression, Whitmer, somebody to jump in at the end. So it's, it's really hard to see what the game plan is beyond that. Right. Um, because if, if Biden shows really dramatic weakness in some of those early primaries, um, what is plan B? Are you really going to rally? Or is it the party really going to rally around Dean Phillips? Or, you know, is there a way mechanically to uh, shift it to or maybe in the late, you know, maybe somebody jumps in and, I, but then, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of blissfully ignorant of primary filing deadlines here. So, but um, that would be the scenario. And it's kind of a 1968, or does it convince Biden okay, uh, you know, it really doesn't make sense to run. Um, but then it's a really insider-driven process at that point, which I don't think, um, you know, people, especially within the Democratic Party, would be very happy with. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. It's a new year, time to make yourself better rested, more energized, and a great way to do that is with a Helix Sleep mattress. I took their quiz and I said, you know what? I roll around a lot, I sleep on my back, I need a lot of support, and I got matched with a Dawn Lux mattress that has become a game changer, not just for me, but for my kids. It's their favorite mattress, even though it wasn't designed for them. Helix will now actually tailor mattresses specifically for big and tall customers and for kids. They have a 100-night trial. You can try the mattress for three months, send it back, and a 10- to 15-year warranty. It's the top-rated mattress by Wired and many other publications. Don't take my word for it. Try it out for yourself. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and Two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and use code helixpartner20. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Well, I, I think this is the, the plan, Patrick, that Joe Biden wakes up on January 24th He's like, wait, I lost New Hampshire. I'm 81 years old. I'm at 37% in the polls. Like, what, what's happening? And then someone goes up to him and says, Joe, according to our numbers, you're, you're going to be neck and neck with Dean in M Michigan, too. This thing's going to drag out. Uh, and then Joe Biden decides to go George Washington and say, as a statesman, uh, I am going yeah. to be passing the baton to the next generation. He'd then be able to have a very heavy hand in the process, to your point. And if it winds up Dean Phillips, who I think would defeat Trump, great. If it winds up with another candidate who I think could defeat Trump, great. Um, but that to me is the, the great opportunity because if we just let this play out, uh, I don't think Joe's number is all of a sudden shoot up. Uh, you know, I, I think it's difficult to rejuvenate energy around a candidate who is going is going to be campaigning at 81 and anytime you're with you see him you think wow he is not the same as he was even four years ago yeah i mean i think i take your point i mean i think that that is uh that's right um that uh you know this could create 
a panic situation if, you know, in fact, Dean Phillips is able to edge out Biden. Now, of course, they'll say, well, he wasn't on the ballot. They have an excuse, right? So they're going to try and test it. But I mean, I really feel like, uh, you know, politics these days is really uh, parties are making decisions for really short term reasons. Right. Uh, you know, Republicans can't get rid of Trump because if you get rid of Trump, you are just admitting the deep state was right. Or if you get rid of Biden, you're going to have this chaotic process. And so uh, my fear is like kind of he hangs on. Right. Uh, you know, he you know, he tries to hang on. And I think that's sort of been the pattern because, you know, sometimes you can hang on in, in difficult circumstances and come back and win. I also think the, you know, the the faith in the polling industry right now, right, is so poor that I feel like the polls are probably going to be, uh, a lot of people feel like the polls are going to be off by more than they're going to move over the next year, right? I mean, we could see essentially the same thing over the next year, the polls saying what they say, and then, oops, it's it, either Trump wins in a huge landslide or Biden somehow ekes it out. I mean, I think there's all this, this hopium, right, that people are taking that, oh, well, the polls, you can't believe the polls, you can't trust the polls, you've got these insular partisan echo chambers where people are repeating them this stuff to themselves every day. And I'm like, no, I, I, as a pollster, I say, no, you can't necessarily take everything we say as gospel, right? But uh, we need to have some grounding in reality, right? You need to have some common sense here. I'm with you, man. And, uh, you know, one poll, two polls, I think, okay, maybe, maybe not. But when, when it starts getting past like the 20 polls, then I was like, okay, this might actually reflect reality. And certainly someone like you, Traffics in reality and data. It's one reason why I enjoyed your book so much is that it was chock full of real life facts and math and numbers from around the country over the last period of years. And it projects forward what uh, the election could look like in, let's say, 2036, which I, I very much enjoyed. Uh, it's only through data like yours that you get a real sense of what the future can hold. So congratulations on this book, Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. How can people keep up with you and your work, Patrick? So yeah, I, I'm on, I'm at my name, Patrick Ruffini, on most platforms, including X, Twitter, uh, you know, threads, all those places. And I also have a Substack at uh, www.patrickruffini.com um, where uh, I send out my longer form pieces. Well, congratulations on this very, very fact-based book. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have you back to talk about how the heck this, uh, um, this primary season plays out. Thanks so much. 